I am, however, inclined to say that a good story is its own justification. And from the opening round in Pennsylvania where the Constitution supporters almost blew it by pushing too hard, through the game-saving strategy of Massachusetts, the heart-stopping uh, decision of the New Hampshire Convention to adjourn just as everyone thought it was going to ratify uh, Patrick Henry's game-stealing performance at the Virginia Convention in Richmond, the cliffhanger New York Convention in Poughkeepsie, and North Carolina's stubborn no, even after the unamended Constitution had more than the nine state votes required for it to go into effect over those states, the story of the Constitution's ratification is a terrific, dramatic story. And it had its moments equal to those in novels, uh, the best, of, I think, of novels. Uh, my editor's personal favorite was the point in the Massachusetts Convention where John Hancock was carried in, wrapped, as the sources say, in flannel. Uh, Hancock was a powerfully important governor of the state. He had basically healed the divisions of Shays' Rebellion more than anybody else. He'd been elected in a uh, Boston delegate, and the convention immediately made it his, pres his president, although he wasn't there. He was home suffering from a, an attack of gout, which some said was a political disease. That as soon as it became clear which way the convention was going to vote, and Massachusetts was also a cliffhanger, uh, he'd get well soon enough. But instead, the Federalists cut a deal with him that they wanted to propose amendments for ratification uh, so that would be, they recommended for consideration once the Constitution was ratified, and they got him to present them. Uh, they, they said they'd support him for governor if Virginia didn't ratify. Who'd be the next president? Why, of course, it would have to be Hancock, and they'd support him. Yeah, Hancock bought it and agreed to go in, and he made his, his appearance in this incredibly dramatic way. And then the vote in Massachusetts, uh, like in other places, they, it, they had to find a church that could accommodate uh, tons of people who wanted to hear it. There were 370 delegates elected. I think 364 attended. They found a church that it could accommodate six to 800 people in the galleries, gallery, galleries, that is sort of balconies. But when the vote was taken, and nobody was 100% sure how it was gonna go, uh, every square foot of the place was stuffed. They had people in something called the cellar, which turns out not to be the basement. It's kind of a mezzanine, best I can tell. But the place, full of people, fell dead silent when the vote was taken. They said you could hear a coin drop. The only sound was the clerk calling out the delegates' names one by one and their answer, yay or nay. <laughs> And you could see people in your mind's eye scribbling, oh, I thought he was going to be on the other side. Does that change? How does that change things? And in the end, Massachusetts had voted to ratify 187 to 168, a difference of 19 votes. Nine delegates didn't vote, were absent. I mean, in, in one of the biggest of all the conventions. And then once the vote was announced, the bells all over Boston started to ring. And this is a town of churches. You know, I, I didn't make that up. I w recorded the story. And I have to say, when I read what I write, I get choked up. <laughs> the contrast between the silence and the tolling of the bells seems so powerful to me. And I forget, uh, one last thing, uh, Patrick Henry's thunderstorm speech. He was, there he was at the Pennsylvania Convention, which he, uh, the Virginia Convention, which he dominated talking at the his high point of his eloquence, talking about the beings of higher uh, order in their ethereal mansions, looking down on the Americans, deciding the fate not only of their country but of mankind, when what happens? Boom! There's a big thunderclap. <laughs> you know, they were listening, I guess. It must have been pretty amazing. Well, then there were characters. Some of you may have heard of James Wilson, the, uh, Pennsylvania, the great lawyer and future 
a Supreme Court justice, but what about his opponent, the self-educated Irish immigrant William Findlay, the young Massachusetts lawyer from Andover, William Symes, who dared to question his own old law teacher, the forbidding Theophilus Parsons, and came out on top? Francis Damer, our first um, minister to Russia, a, a, a sickly man, but whose powerful oratory left the throngs crowding the convention in Boston, and even some reporters absolutely spellbound, so spellbound the reporters forgot to take notes. Jonathan Smith, the farmer from the western part of that state, whose endorsement of the Constitution based on his frightening experience during Shays' Rebellion came at exactly the right moment. Or Zachariah Johnston, whom one observer called the best speaker at the Virginia Convention, better it seems than even Patrick Henry or James Madison. And Henry, Thomas Jefferson said, was the best orator of all time, moving words from Thomas Jefferson, who hated Patrick Henry. <laughs> I was personally awed by James Madison's probing analysis of the Constitution of the North Carolina's convention, his first convention, and thought his opponent, Judge Samuel Spence, was uncommonly good. But above all, there was Melanchthon Smith, the short, stubby man with unruly hair, without whose efforts the New York Convention would probably not have voted to ratify, and his friend and fellow congressman, Nathan Dane of Massachusetts, who sent Smith some of the wisest, most statesmanlike political counsel I have encountered in all my readings. That there were such men is itself significant. It shows that the country was not dependent on a handful of great men. The United States had a deep bench. That's not to say Washington wasn't indispensable or Hamilton wasn't brilliant or Madison wasn't learned. In the end, however, there were others who might have moved forward into national office and sometimes did, but who more often spent their political lives within their states. They and their constituents, an important part of the story, invested their minds and their hearts in evaluating the Constitution and its probable impact on what they repeatedly called millions yet unborn. That in the end, they supported ratification as only part of their gifts to our country. As I say in my book, they made the republic work. It was very satisfying to be able to give them finally the place in American history that they had earned so long ago. It felt like an act of justice long overdue. It was also satisfying to give my country the other half of its founding story. We have had the elite part, the story of those 55 demigods, as Jefferson called them, who wrote the Constitution. Now we also have the democratic part of the story, the part that tells how an energized people who knew their power and took their responsibility seriously shaped the future of their nation. Perhaps that's the part we most need to know. It brings the story down to earth, gives us models, and maybe even inspiration. In a real sense, it's our story, and that's why we should care. Thank you.